I'd like to welcome everyone um, to uh, the beginning of our uh, Arctic Symposium. Uh, this is uh, our first session to, to kick things off. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, on behalf of uh, Marine Corps University, uh, Norwegian Defense University College, uh, the Marine Corps University Foundation, um, this uh, is a, a great event that we've all been very excited uh, and looking forward to, to kicking off what we hope is uh, an inaugural series uh, that explore uh, policies and strategies uh, and tactics uh, today, at least uh, today and tomorrow, uh, underpinning security in, in the pine. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Dr. Lon Strauss. I am with uh, the Command and Staff College here at Harvard University and uh, my co-host, and my name is uh, Njord Vegge. I'm working as an associate professor at Norwegian Defense University College. Uh, and on our uh, panel today, uh, we are very happy to introduce uh, these distinguished guests that we're really excited uh, to have with us. Um, yeah, and uh, we'll uh, start out with um, Her Excellency Annikim Krutnes. She is uh, Norway's ambassador to the United States. And her previous uh, area was uh, being Norway's ambassador to, Antar to Arctic and Antarctic affairs. Before we, we let you uh, kick off the whole thing, we do have to uh, offer a disclaimer, um, just so that we all we all understand and our audience understands that um, uh, anything that is said uh, in this event doesn't necessarily represent uh, Marine Corps University or uh, Norwegian Defense University College or uh, the government of Norway or the government of, of the United States and our views uh, of our own. We are happy to start with Anakin afterwards. And we also have uh, uh, Kenneth Braithwaite, uh, Norway's, uh, the, he has been the ambassador to Norway, also the former uh, Secretary of the Navy, and has been working with the Department of the Navy's Tri-Service Maritime Strategy. Uh, we'll come back to that later. We also have uh, Major General Lars Lerwick, coming from Norway yesterday. He's chief of the Norwegian army. Um, he has previously been the Norway's Brigade North commander. And we're also happy to have uh, uh, Douglas uh, Clark. You are the Briga Brigadier General and uh, um, uh, Deputy Commander of NATO's Joint Warfare Center, which recently led the uh, high level exercises and uh, call response. And online, we have with us uh, Brigadier General uh, Anthony Henderson, who's the Deputy uh, TUMEF Commander. Uh, the TUMEF uh, Commander uh, was previously the Director of Plans and Concepts at the Marine Corps uh, Warfighting Lab uh, during the time that they were writing and wargaming the tentative manual uh, for EABO. So we're really uh, looking forward to his comments as well. Sure. So with that, Ambassador, please. So that's <laughs> Perfect. So then I can thank you for organizing this. Uh, I really appreciate you doing this. I, I think we need to share our knowledge and our experience uh, on the Arctic. Um, and if you put on the first slide, I would like to um, underline one point. The Arctic is huge and it is diversified. And when you think of the Arctic, um, maybe you think of, of um, ice and polar bears and, and just the vast areas of land with no people. Um, and that's right, that's the Arctic, but this is also the Arctic. Um, and all these pictures are from Tromsø, uh, or close to Tromsø, well beyond the Arctic Circle. And my point is um, that um, the Arctic is not one place. The Arctic is huge and so diversified, and people live in the Arctic. And we cannot make uh, the Arctic a museum, um, because uh, people live there, people have to make their living. 10% um, of Norway's population live in the Arctic. Next slide will uh, give you an idea, and I'm sure um, you're uh, very familiar with what, what is the Arctic. Um, so this is the map seen from the top of the world. Um, and as you will see, uh, the Arctic is basically um, an ocean, the central Arctic Ocean, surrounded by land. Is actually the opposite of Antarctic, which is land surrounded by ocean. Um, so, uh, and you will see um, the countries uh, that are part of the Arctic, and you will see which countries also have a coastal line to the Arctic Ocean. 
<coughs> Next slide uh, will show you that what I call the Arctic Ocean is basically ice, or at least it was ice. Um, and these pictures, they are dated, uh, so you can see the date, uh, 1980 and, and 2020. So you can see the change, the receding ice. And this is, of course, um, what has brought so much attention to the Arctic, um, the changing situation. Climate uh, and climate change is the biggest threat to Arctic. Um, and we should all do what we can and, and uh, this week and next week in Glasgow uh, you know there's the COP26 and we all have a responsibility to do what we can to keep that temperature down uh, or keep it from rising more than 1.5 degrees. Um, I have to remember though uh, that uh, the climate change is a result of global emissions so we who live in the Arctic can do and should do everything we can to cut emissions, but that will not help a lot. We need the rest of the world to cut emissions because uh, the temperature is rising, the ice is receding because of global emissions. Um, one of the emissions that we are very <coughs> uh, aware of is, is methane. And, and I'm happy that the US has launched a new initiative on methane, and did that in COP, and, and has has um, become part of that initiative because methane has this capacity to, to increase temperature uh, and it's a very local emission. So, so getting rid of methane emissions in the Arctic would be something we in the Arctic could do and we are doing. And, and just for uh, to mention it, we have you know, oil and gas production, but we don't have fairings, we don't have any emissions of methane. But I'm not here to talk about the climate change, uh, but what, what this leads to, and of course the opening of the Arctic Ocean leads to access to resources. And um, I don't know if you remember, there was a front page on Time magazine a long time ago when Chiligaro, this Russian polar explorer, planted a, a Russian flag on the North Pole or on the sea bottom. And, and everybody said, oh, there's this rush for resources. This is the new West. Uh, this is uh, an unregulated place where they have uh, all kinds of resources, oil, gas, rare minerals on the sea bottom. Uh, let's run there and get it. Uh, that never happened. And one of the reasons is that this area is actually regulated. If you go to the next slide and just skip it and then go to the next one. This um, is a meeting in 2008 in Ilulisat in Greenland. And you will maybe recognize in the picture some of the people. Number two from left is Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister. He was foreign minister in 2008 also. He's been forever. And um, the guy with the white sweater is uh, Jonas Gastore. He's uh, now our prime minister. He was foreign minister then. The gentleman with the hat, you should know, Negroponte, John Negroponte, was the deputy foreign minister, deputy to Kavde, and the Ras. They all met in Ilulisa in 2008 to say that um, the Arctic is changing. Um, we need to agree on how to deal with that. And they signed the Ilulisa declaration that basically says that we will use the law of the sea to regulate everything going on in the Arctic because the law of the sea covers. The Arctic is, is sea, it's ocean. So uh, the law of the sea convention is perfect for fixing everything there. So, so that's what they did. And, and um, therefore uh, we have seen that um, there has been um, a well-governed and regulated development of the Arctic. So if you go to the next slide, um, uh, we can skip that. That's just economic zones, continental shelf, this is another, of course, uh, interesting subject to talk about, and, and uh, we can come back to it. I will not spend a lot of time on it, but you see that, uh, and you know that very well already, that receding of the ice will open up new sea roads, uh, and there is a lot of talk about the northern sea road. Um, we see that it is still not um, uh, commercially feasible to use it as um, a transit route. Um, there is still too much ice. It's not 
very well developed. There's very little search and rescue capacity. Uh, so we see that mainly it is used for transit uh, traffic, um, especially from the Amal Peninsula, where the, the Russians have a, a lot of gas uh, production, and, and they take that out to, to the east, to Asia. Next slide um, is uh, the Arctic Council, just to mention that. Um, so just going back, um, taking one step back, um, we see the Arctic as, as a peaceful and stable and predictable region. And there are mainly three reasons for that. And the first one I mentioned, it's the respect for, for the international law. We let the law, the sea regulate. The second reason is that we have international cooperation. We meet and we discuss issues. And the Arctic Council um, uh, deals with um, a lot of issues and it uh, has shown itself to be a very relevant and dynamic organization. Under the auspices of, of these meetings, uh, the eight Arctic countries have agreed on three international agreements. One on search and rescue, one on uh, oil spill preparedness, and one on research cooperation. And um, I think this it's crucial for, for the Arctic that we had this cooperation between the eight Arctic countries, including Russia. And so, and then the th third, and that is the next slide, the, the third thing that we have to deal with in Arctic together is how to manage the resources in a responsible manner and how to develop uh, the Arctic economically, but in a sustainable way. And uh, this picture is the, the latest Norwegian strategy on the Arctic, uh, where we uh, are taking into account uh, that we are in a transition, that we are transitioning to a green economy. And we also have a blue economy. So you see it's all blue-green up there. Um, so that's uh, the ocean is so important to us. And, and we are uh, going into the green economy. And we're doing that both onshore and offshore in the Arctic. And you even see the space shuttle there. Um, and we can also talk about that if there are any questions. We are developing the yeah, space industry. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention, and I don't have a slide on it, but that is, of course, um, that we have a, a big neighbor in the north, um, uh, Russia. And uh, that, um, of course, is defining for our security policy. We are a NATO member, um, and uh, we like to say that we are NATO's ears and eyes in the north. Uh, we are keeping an eye uh, on what is going on there. Um, we've always done that uh, with regard to the Russians, uh, and we are now also keeping an eye on others, uh, such as the Chinese, uh, to, to check on what they are doing in, in the Arctic. Um, We've had uh, a stable relationship to the Russians. We say that uh, the most important thing is to be firm with the Russians, but predictable. So, so that is um, our take on the Russians. We have um, quite some cooperation on, on uh, a practical level with them when it comes to such a rescue, fisheries management, environmental, uh, we, we're cleaning up some nuclear waste for them. Um, we have an agreement on plastic pollution in the ocean. So, so we are working with the Russians on practical level. But at the same time, of course, we stand with our allies and partners uh, in, in our reaction to Russia's violations of, of international law, their annexation of Crimea, uh, their aggressiveness in, in Eastern Ukraine, and, and we follow the EU and our allies in, in the sanctions regime towards Russia. And, and I know that others can talk more about uh, our military positioning and our signaling uh, towards Russia, but, but I just like to mention that we're always careful that we have to balance um, the, the deterrence and the reassurance uh, in our policy to, towards Russia. So I think for an introduction, uh, I will leave it like at that, and then I'm happy to take uh, questions afterwards. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much.
Um, so we are going to save questions uh, till after we go through uh, all of our presentations. Um, and that was a great way to, to start things off. So thank you, Ambassador. And then uh, we'd love to hand it off to uh, Secretary Braithwaite, uh, if you would. Sure, Doctor. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here back at Quantico amongst uh, my brothers, the Marines. Um, after 31 years in the uniform of a naval officer, and the most recently uh, having the honor to serve as the 77th Secretary of the Navy, uh, the Marine Corps is near and dear to my heart. I uh, had a uh, conversation with General Mattis last night and told him that I would be here. Um, and it's important that we convene and it's important that we talk about these kind of issues. And it's especially important today, more than it's been in a long time, for the United States to re-emphasize its partnerships and its alliances, especially with nations like the Kingdom of Norway. Um, my time in Norway was probably some of the most rewarding years of my life. Um, I learned so much while I was there. And I think as I look back and I ask myself the question that Senator Rubio asked me at my confirmation hearing, what is it that I thought the United States could learn from Norway? Um, I learned a great deal. But what I learned most was the importance of the relationship uh, in the Arctic that Norway has maintained uh, with Russia. Um, because as we all know, um, we fought a Cold War with the Soviet Union. Um, and we came out of that uh, with a renewed commitment to peace. That peace was global, but especially um, how it was to be carried out um, in the Arctic, which is such a big part of Norwegian life, or as Ambassador Krudness pointed out, the Norwegians live and thrive in the Arctic. Um, my experience in the Arctic is a little different. I first traveled there as a young naval aviator uh, back in 1987, um, hunting then, uh, or tracking, we should say, uh, Soviet submarines. And uh, the western side of our nation, uh, which takes in the great state of Alaska, is a much different Arctic than what you discover in the high north of Europe. Um, in 1867, shortly after the end of the American Civil War, a gentleman by the name of William H. Seward, he was actually um, a political foe of President Abraham Lincoln. Um, Lincoln chose Secretary Seward to be his Secretary of State um, for many reasons. Um, most importantly, Secretary Seward was a visionary. And in the summer of 1867, he carried out probably one of the greatest coups that the United States has ever carried out. He purchased the entire territory of Alaska for $7.2 million. Now, $7.2 million today, you know, we ask ourselves, uh, you know, it's a lot of money back in 1867. But was it? In today's dollars, that equates to about 133 million US dollars for the vast territory of Alaska. That's a great deal. Although the press back in 1867 labeled that Seward's folly because he bought a bunch of frozen tundra. But did he? No, the visionary that Secretary Seward was knew that that land and land, let's just be honest, should mean everything to a nation. It was full of minerals. It was full of natural resources. Most importantly, back then, the wildlife that existed there in the fur trade. But America tripped into the latter part of the 19th and early 20th century as a reluctant Arctic nation. In fact, today, Professor, if I walked on the streets of the Capitol here in Washington, I asked the average American who the eight members of the Arctic Council were, and is the United States one of them? I would argue to say that we'd be hard pressed to find one in 10 who would admit to the fact that we are in fact um, an Arctic nation. 21% of the undiscovered oil resources reside above the Arctic Circle. 28% of undiscovered natural gas. 1.5 to $2 trillion in rare earth minerals. And that's only along the Russian border, not to take in Canada, the United States, Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Iceland. Oh, and by the way, Secretary Seward also tried to buy both Greenland 
and Iceland. <laughs> Somebody else got chastised for trying that same thing not too long ago. <laughs> Russia gets 20% of its GDP from the Arctic. And today, we are focused on the Arctic because of global warming. Now, I will tell you that in my perspective, from what I've seen with my eyes as the young Navy pilot flying over the Arctic to then being the U.S. ambassador to Norway, the Arctic is thawing. When I was secretary, um, I brought Dr. Burbick in from the Naval War College and others to write a new U.S. Navy and Marine Corps strategy on the Arctic because ladies and gentlemen, the Arctic is important to our national security. In 1935, General Billy Mitchell, another visionary, an aviator, if you don't know the story behind General Mitchell, testified before Congress, before the US Senate. And he quote, he said, Alaska is the most strategic place on earth, critical to the economic survivability of the United States and more importantly, our national security. So you ask yourself, from our perspective, why has Russia and more recently China pivoted to the high north? Is it because of the natural resources? Is it because of the strategic choke points that allow us to move our goods throughout the world? Just last month in the New York Times, President Putin celebrated his birthday, his 69th birthday, by talking about his renewed interest, Russia's renewed interest, and their buildup of military capabilities in the Arctic. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at a crucial point in the history of our nation to recognize the importance of the Arctic for what it means to the United States but moreover, what it means to all the nations of the world. We need to renew our commitment as a leader in the high north, to be present, to show the importance of what the Arctic means, again, not only to the United States, but to the rest of the free world. To do that will require a commitment, a commitment on a reluctant nation who hesitates to call themselves an Arctic nation because of the resources that that demands. And I will tell you from a front row seat, I was in those debates and those arguments to try to redirect those resources when we have all the other competing challenges around the globe. It is a real tricky situation for us to address. But America has a responsibility as a leader of the free world to be present in the Arctic, to ensure freedom of the seas in the Arctic, to ensure that it remains the peaceful place that it has historically been, that my dear friends, the Norwegians, have ensured that it has been by their involvement and their commitment to maintaining that peace in the high north. So it is with that that I am very pleased to be here with you all today and to share in this dialogue and to take whatever easy questions you can throw at me. Um, I am happy uh, to do that. So back over to you, uh, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Breakwit. Um, then I'm also very happy to um, see you here, uh, Lervik. Uh, you actually arrived last night. I'm sure you've had a short uh, night, but I hope you're doing good, and uh, I'm happy to, to introduce you. Uh, your Please have a call. Thank you very much. Being um, a soldier, we are used to and actually living off of short nights. Um, uh, Norwegian and the overall strategic situation in the Arctic has been covered well by Her Excellency Anniken Kutnes and also the Honorable Kenneth Waitwit. Uh, I will try to add some value by um, commenting from the military perspective. And go, going back to to the to uh, to Norway, Norway learned a an important lesson from the Second World War, that there is a difference between friends and allies. That's why we were among the founding members of NATO in 1949. And that's also why we have since then and are continuing to have a strong relationship with the US. Norway has historically had a peaceful relationship with Russia. We've never been at war with Russia. Our northernmost province, Finnmark, was liberated by the Red Army in October 1944. And also, as already mentioned, we have um, cooperated 
uh, in regards to handling fisheries and other commercial activities. Both during the Cold War and, and also now, as the ambassador has already alluded to, our relationship with Russia can be characterized as a combination of a firm deterrence with our allies and engagement where that is possible. The worsened uh, international security situation and significant increase in military activity in the Arctic also influences Norway and our approach to security and defense uh, related issues. There has been a, uh, an increase in defense spending over the last few years, and the latest defense white paper stated clearly that our security is, first of all, based on a strong national defense and our NATO membership. But it also elevated our close bilateral cooperation with our closest allies, especially the US, into the third pillar of our defense strategy. Climate change has also been commented by both the previous speakers and is on everyone's radar these days. And um, the UN Climate Change Conference underlines its importance for all of us. With the melting polar ice caps, increased the availability of the Northern Sea route. In addition, reduction of ice in the Arctic increases the avail availability of the region and will probably result in more activities related to fisheries, natural resources, and even tourism. The Arctic is considered very important by Russia. This can be illustrated by the fact that a few years ago, a Russian deputy prime minister stated that the Arctic is Russia's Mecca. The Kola Peninsula is also the home of Russia's nuclear second strike capability. This means that Russia attaches existential value to this area and to maintain their own freedom of movement uh, in, in the Arctic. The combined factors of climate change and the positioning of crucial Russian military assets makes it likely that the Arctic will continue to be and probably also rise in the geostrategic importance. What are then the key security trends and challenges this presents from a military, military perspective? First, a few comments on the Russian military a development seen from the Norwegian and the Norwegian army's perspective. It is no surprise that Russia's military in the Arctic has gone through a major modernization and upgrade as other uh, parts of the Russian military. We have seen the establishment of new units like a new mechanized uh, brigade as a part of the land forces on the Kola Peninsula. And the Northern Fleet has been upgraded to the status of the, as a military district on the same level as the other four Russian military districts. A wide range of new military equipment has been introduced. Examples are new multi-row submarines, several types of long-range precision missile systems, and modernized main battle tanks. We have also seen a significant increase in activity over the last few years, with units belonging to the Northern Fleet, participating in Russian military operations in Syria and the Ukraine. The training in the Arctic, in all domains, has increased in size and complex, uh, complexity, demonstrating a Russian ability to do joint combined arms operations on the level that was not there just a few years ago. This training has also included training with bombers flying attack profiles against targets in Norway, and we experience frequent GPS jamming in the eastern parts of our northernmost province, Finnmark, close to the border. A few comments on, on, on China. China is, is not yet a military power in the Arctic. However, but uh, in, both in ambition for the use of the Northern Sea Route and its relationship to, due to its relationship to the United States and Russia, it makes it a relevant actor for also us in Norway to watch. And the Chinese declaration of itself as a near Arctic state in 2018 and the following US response to this positioning is an example of development that we are following. Then to our allied and the allied focus on the Arctic. Over the last few years, and especially after 2014, we have seen a significant increase in allied focus on and activity in Norway and our neighborhood. This has resulted in a significant increase in military training in our area, 
illustrated by exercise Trident Juncture in 2018, with more than 50,000 uh, Allied soldiers participating and training uh, in, uh, in Norway. And next year, we are hosting exercise Cold Response, with about 30,000 Allied soldiers training in and around Norway. For us in the Norwegian Army, we have been heavily engaged in hosting and supporting Allied Army and Marines. And thousands of Allied soldiers have been conducting training together with us and alongside our units. And that has now become the new normal for the Army. The fundamental nature of war does not change. It always include, involves a clash of wills, violence, friction, the fog Clausewitz talked about, maneuvers and deception. At the same time, the character of war continues to evolve and become even more persuasive with our competitors conducting activities that sit outside the normal peace, crisis, war dynamics. This is reflected in the new joint land doctrine from NATO with the description of continuous competition with four different levels, cooperation, rivalry, confrontation, and armed conflict. To discuss this in detail would require a full lecture on its own, but I would like to, to point out two key takeaways I take from the new doctrine. First of all, it under, underlines the importance of cooperation between allies. Secondly, in the new normal with continuous co competition, training and exercises is no longer something we do to prepare for operations. That is now training and exercises are an integral part of our daily operations. What are then the main challenges and opportunities seen from the Norwegian Army headquarters north of the Arctic Circle? Uh, we consider ourselves an inside force, or to use the U.S. Marine Corps terminology, a stand-in force. And the key, dedu key deductions from being inside an adversary's weapon range are that we need, first of all, to be present every day at the most important locations. We also need to recognize that the warning times have been significantly reduced, and therefore we have and will continue to increase the readiness of the Norwegian army. With high intensity warfare again against a pair adversary in our area back on the table as an unlikely but still possible option, uh, we must strengthen both the quality and quantity of the Norwegian army and the Norwegian defense. That includes ensuring that we are interoperable with our allies and that allies are as well prepared as possible to operate in the Arctic. So what are we then doing to address this um, and then focusing on the army? Uh, the Nor Norwegian army is about to launch a historic growth with a 50% increase in manpower over the next 10 years and a 300% increase in investments in equipment and infrastructure within the next five years. This will address some of the shortfalls in regards to capabilities with key elements being the replacement of our 40-year-old main battle tanks, reintroduction of modern air defense systems, and investments in long-range precision fires. Furthermore, and maybe even more important, we are modernizing our ability to sustain and support both our own forces and our allies by establishing new military units designed for this task, and also by enhancing our ability to take advantage of the civilian capabilities that are available uh, from the framework of our total defense concept. <laughs> our readiness will continue to be improved and we will strengthen our presence with combat ready units, new and old combat ready units in prioritized areas in mainly in Northern Norway. We are also introducing a modern C4IS system reducing our own vulnerability and increasing our interoperability with Norwegian Joint Force and our allies. And inter interoperability with our allies continue to be one of my top priorities. In regards to NATO, this results in the Norwegian Army still participating with a substantial part of our force in NATO's High Readiness Force. 
and also continuous commitments to NATO's enhanced forward presence in Lithuania. And we are strengthening our cooperation both in regards to training and operational planning with the first German Netherlands Corps. This also enhances our cooperation with our most important European allies, Germany and the Netherlands. We are also strengthening the bilateral cooperation with our Nordic neighbors, the French army and UK's Royal Marines. But our main emphasis has been and still is on increasing our cooperation and integration with the US. The US Marine Corps Norwegian Army cooperation has over the last three to four years involved significantly from initially training alongside each other, then to training together to today's integration between the Norwegian Army and especially the second Marine Expeditionary Force where training and exercises, operational planning and conceptual development is being conducted together every day, 365 days a year. We are currently working on enhancing our cooperation with the US Army, aiming to reach as close to and maybe the same level of integration that we have managed to establish with the US Marine Corps. That concludes <clears throat> my introductory remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was, that was great, very detailed. Uh, so I look forward again to, to hitting all these, uh, these comments in the discussion, um, but uh, for our next presenter, we don't want to uh, forget that we also have uh, General Henderson uh, online. So uh, General Henderson, uh, if you are ready, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Ian, uh, thank you, can you hear me? I'm trying to make sure I'm manipulating this correctly. Thank you. I want to uh, start off with uh, thank you for the opportunity from the Krulak Center. Very honored to be with this panel here. It's a very distinguished group uh, from my Ambassador and Secretary Braithwaite uh, uh, to Ambassador uh, Krutnis and, and General Ervik, as well as um, uh, Brigadier General Clark. Uh, thank you for coming all this way, coming back home to have this conversation. It tells you how important the Arctic is to you. I uh, as you as you mentioned earlier in the introduction, I am the Deputy Commanding General for Second Marine Expeditionary Force, and on behalf of Lieutenant General William Journey, it's a, it's our pleasure to participate in this conversation this morning and uh, going forward. The talking about the northern flank and the Arctic, and I have listened to the distinguished panel here, and it's in our comments here, and I highlight some of them uh, before I then move into the context of the Second Marine Expeditionary Force as a premier fighting force here in the Marine Corps uh, relative to particularly our European uh, partners and allies. So Norway sees the Arctic as a peaceful and stable region. And that seems like the overall objective that all of our operations, all of our force design and capabilities should be designed towards. And as Ambassador Braithwaite laid out the visionaries of the past who saw from Alaska to other Arctic areas, their importance, uh, it still is true today, but will it be even more so true tomorrow? You know, so the resources there, uh, then the ability for passage through the Arctic because we have a climate condition that has changed the space, which has really happened in the last couple of generations. So climate condition that has changed geographic space to the uh, point that it will pull has a nexus many uh, competitors and partners into that space in cooperation to competition, diplomatically, militarily, and economically, and the necessary uh, uh, information activities that'll come from that. So uh, from listening to Major General Erpik, the difference between friends and allies is understood here well into MEP and the ability for us to integrate and operate between our NATO allies and our partners it will be reflected in the upcoming exercise next spring with Cold Response 22 and how uh, Second Marine Expeditionary Force will fully participate in that uh, exercise because as he described, it is an exercise in competition. It is not devoid of that context as described under our current strategic approach 
of competing with our adversaries uh, in different layers from blunt to contact. For us too, MEF, we've designed a, a five-year campaign approach to how we develop our operating ability our, to be our war fighting ability as a force. There are some very e simple lines of efforts as we would use the term, and we understand from military design of how we achieve that campaign goal of being able to operate and function and compete against peer adversaries across the globe. You know, we're, we're preparing ourselves to be able to prevail in competition to conflict in the US UCOM AOR, as well as anywhere else required in the globe. We're moving ourselves in our next line of effort of how we achieve more than just naval integration as a naval force, but naval war fighting abilities and capacities. Often I note that term from integration to war fighting because the word integration is often being used right now with different other buzz terms, naval, joint, et cetera, et cetera. But as we've had to sit here and to MEF and describe to the force, we're not doing integration for integration's sake. We're moving towards our naval capability in order to be able to fight below, uh, to compete below armed conflict, and if necessary, win in that conflict. Next to that is generating and sustaining a ready force. It is a challenge with our global commitments to sustain and generate and sustain a ready force while at the same time moving the force towards a greater modernization and an advancement along our naval concepts of distributed maritime operations, littoral operations in a contested environment, and expeditionary advanced based operations, which we can discuss as we go through a further uh, Q and A in that. All interlinked naval concepts under our tri-service maritime strategy. So for QMEF, then the final thing to achieve all of that requires the interoperability with our allies and partners. And in that interoperability would be designed to keep a peaceful and stable region in the Arctic. To achieve the vision articulated by our predecessors in the purchase of Alaska and our participation in the Arctic uh, in the past, and to demonstrate the difference between friends, allies, and competitors. So I'll stop there. I wanted to keep my comments short and allow for a greater Q&A and turn to that. I think uh, uh, the previous speakers have really laid some great foundation for us to move forward with. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brigadier General Henderson. Um, then I'm uh, pleased to give the floor to our other Brigadier General, Douglas uh, Clark. So uh, coming and uh, representing NATO, please. Yeah, thank you so much. It really is a privilege to be here. And, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, when I when I just uh, had a chance to, to shake the Secretary's hand, I reminded him, I met him 14 months ago um, as the Secretary. And I remember some of his remarks uh, in preparation for his visit. People said, the secretary loves Norway, just so you know. <laughs> and I had orders to go to Norway. And everybody in my class said, do not tell anybody you're going to Norway. That's all we're going to talk about. We want to talk about there's more to the world than just Norway. Well, of course, uh, this, the secretary has expressed that in uh, his signature on, on the, uh, the Blue Arctic, among other things, uh, his testimony to that. But... I get it now after 14 months of living in Norway and working with our allies and partners of the 30 nations that compose NATO, I get it. And, um, and I thought I would share, I, I thought it was great. Uh, and of course the ambassador was, was prudent enough to have slides, uh, understanding her audience better than the rest of us. Uh, and so, um, but it was great because it, it laid the background and it showed the view, a view that Americans do not appreciate. And just to, to share with, uh, with those on the call that are that are uh, have never been to Norway, where I, I live and work is a, a great town, a nautical town, Stavanger. If that was New Orleans, where the Russian border and the Norway border is, would be say Boston. So understand the the, the depth and the space 
uh, and then the time as we talk uh, military instruments, but even just economic instruments, this is a very challenging terrain. A couple other things, just I think that it's important is that we have to know each other uh, as, as we are truly friends. There is truly a friendship and a partnership between Norway and the United States. Um, and it's, it's uh, the United States is very proud of that relationship. The Marine Corps is very proud of that. And, uh, and I've, I'm the first Marine to share in this billet. Uh, it's previously been Air Force and two Navy admirals prior to me. And a lot of people said, well, I, I didn't realize that the Marine Corps had a, a general officer in Norway. And I said, I'm the first one. But then people will always turn and go, but it makes sense. Well, it's a joint billet, but I will tell you, it does make a lot of sense. And, uh, and as our partnership develops, as the Major General talked about it, uh, it, makes, it makes immense volumes of sense. Just a couple other things real quick, uh, just talking background for those that haven't had the privilege, uh, put it on your bucket list to get to Norway. It is one of the most beautiful places you've ever seen, but it's a lot deeper than just the beauty of Norway. Um, these people are tough. If you get a chance to watch the movie, The Kings Know, the Kangen Nai, I, I don't know if I visit, it's Kangen Nai, did I say that right? Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> but it speaks to a very rich heritage uh, of uh, a very proud people that didn't give in to the Nazis uh, many moons ago. And you can see that in the way that we do business with them. And I think that's part of the reason that the Marines love working with them. These are tough people. They're beautiful people uh, who care a lot about uh, their neighbors. And, um, and, and it's really important. Another point that's really important about Norwegians is they can't wait to get rid of this one meter social distance COVID thing. So they can go back to five meters <laughs> social distance. So, uh, but they're five and a half million people over the vast expanse that covers the distance I've already alluded to. Um, and so uh, um, a lot of terrain to cover with five and a half million people. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm confident that if, uh, if required and nobody wants it, no warrior to praise for war, um, but they're, that, they're, uh, that they're tough and they can fight. Um, and uh, another observation I will make is that you can't be a flag officer in the Norwegian services unless you're two meters tall. Mm -hmm. That's another true fact. I, I don't know what it is, but these guys are enormous. But, um, the, the, and the last comment on that, just set in the background for those of you who haven't had the privilege of being there, they, they live by the modern, these are civilians, these aren't military people. There's just no such thing as bad weather. There's only bad kit, there's only bad gear. And you will see in the worst of weather, uh, people, I got passed up on a really nice climb one time by a grandmother who's easily 20 years my senior, eating me up like a steak dinner. Um, these are tough people and they love the terrain and uh, I, I highly recommend you go see it. But virtual presence is in fact actual absence. And the reason I say that is because only by having an actual presence in critical areas can we truly deter as the US in concert with our allies and partners to, de to deter adversaries. Um, our, we have uh, you know, friends throughout our partnerships and, and our allies, et cetera, that say we will be there. The Marine Corps is there. Marine Corps is there, as the Major General said, 365 days out of the year. Alongside the Marine Corps pre-positioning program in Norway, of course, the most people are familiar with McPippin, and of course, the newest iteration, the Murphy, the Marine Rotational Force Europe, our dynamic presence in the Norwegian high north is facilitating credible deterrence and reassurance to our NATO's, uh, NATO allies in the Arctic. The physical presence of McPippin and Murphy in Norway represent an essential demonstration of partnership and cooperation, where competition is heating up between great powers. Russia, China, et cetera. It's real, it's increasing, it's important. And the fractured blueing Arctic, as we've already talked about, um, an ocean previously frozen white, but now becoming navigable, uh, has to be part of our conversation. So the United States Marine Corps' continued presence in the blueing Arctic is setting the conditions for the joint force, as well as partner and allied Arctic nations to maintain a secure operating environment, open for economic competition, throughout an unprecedented scenario influenced by the changing climate. Some of the other points uh, that, that I thought I'd comment on, especially based on, on where I come from, is as a NATO joint officer, uh, again, most of the United States doesn't know how many, if you asked them how many countries are in NATO, they couldn't answer the question. For those of you who are sitting there going, I don't know the answer to the question. The answer is 30. As of last year, it was 29, and then 
or the Macedonia, and now it's it's 30. So now you you you've got you've come away with a little bit of knowledge. 30 nations in NATO. Um, if you ask the average American what happened in 2014, they the average American does not know what they ate for breakfast. They certainly don't know what happened in 2014. The average European knows what happens in 2014. I think most people on this call uh, understand the these critical significance of a moved border for the first time since World War II in 2014, based on, on a, an irregular hybrid, uh, highly effective uh, maneuver by, by Putin and, and the Russians. So um, the best predictor of future performance is past performance. So we have to take it very, very seriously. Um, so what happened in 2015? Because of Norway's commitment to their allies and partners, of course, they weren't directly impacted by what happened in Ukraine and Crimea. They implemented economic sanctions like most of us did. And what happened? Putin moved 5,000 immigrants up to the border. Again, hybrid, highly successful, highly credible hybrid uh, uh, warrior is what uh, Putin is. And we, we just have to admit it. Um, he's good at it, many times to our detriment. He put 5,000 immigrants on the border and he flushed those immigrants up against the border and pressed them against a very caring, uh, compassionate people. And eventually they relented and those people came in. And there's everyone in Norway talks about the pile of bicycles that's sitting there right on the other side of the border that I had, had the opportunity to frequent a couple weeks ago. Uh, because you can't walk over the border, but you can ride a bike. So they provided them bicycles and they rode over the border. And they were, they were brought in to, to the great people of Norway. Why is that important? because it's happening right now in Lithuania. It's happening right now in other countries. And uh, the Belarusian president, um, you know, is friends with Putin and they're implementing those same techniques, very hybrid, very irregular techniques to exert influence upon uh, the allies and partners of NATO. World War II still matters in Europe and it was referenced previously. We don't talk a lot about World War II in the United States. They talk about it every week in Europe. It destroyed the continent. Our country and our continent was not destroyed. Certainly not to the capacity uh, that was in Europe. It's real and people are still living who, who, who endured that. My mother-in-law was in England and she can tell you stories but you have to press her hard on it about the Battle of Britain uh, and how horrible it was. And so we like to talk uh, you know, in a warlike fashion about Russia and we shouldn't put up with this and we shouldn't put up with what they call up in Finnmark, as was alluded to previously about the, the countermeasures that are happening with GPS blackouts that happen routinely, not every day. They call it up there, they call it the new normal, is that they will routinely lose GPS power. Who's causing it? Russia doesn't admit to doing it, but it, it's, it's, it's uh, more than just a coincidence. So people uh, in the United States might say, oh, we can't have that, really? Because we've got diagnosed influence in our elections, and yet, did we do anything about it? So we have to be very, very careful uh, with our rhetoric as Americans and understanding that Norway is neighbors to Russia. Think about every Russia, uh, every neighbor you've ever had. And the last thing in the world you want to do is fight with your next door neighbor. You just want to live your life and you want to do great things. And think of it in that perspective. That's the perspective that uh, Norway deals with every day. I will say in, in a great two day meeting with the Chad, General Christofferson is a, is a, a, a great warrior in his own right. You know, he said NATO needs to have more of a sense of urgency. And I think that he's right. And so the last thing I'll just touch on is uh, we just completed Steadfast Jupiter 21. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, you know, the Joint Warfare Center, when I was going to the Joint Warfare Center, people said, what is, you know, I said, what is JWC? I did Google JWC NATO when the commandant said, you're going to JWC. We do operational and strategic planning for, for the three and four star headquarters of NATO. And so we just put them through the rigors of, of Jupiter 21, which was a deterrence only exercise. We told NATO, you are not allowed to go to Article 5. For a bunch of people wearing military uniforms, that's really hard to do. Because we threw the kitchen sink at them. And people wanted to say, well, we want to do this and we want to do that. No. You have to deter. It was incredible. It was more challenging than they thought it would be. And at the end of the exercise, we received a lot of tactical comments like we couldn't exercise our fires. We couldn't do this, that, and the other thing. I understand that. 
but the NAC directed that we would do a deterrence operation, and we did. So for the political advisors, for the senior leaders, it was invaluable for the lessons that they were able to learn. To, to learn. Um, some of the, the, the fallout from that, I would just say, is that uh, um, in all of these efforts, we have to think strategically. And I want everyone to take a step back and think about what we are doing. We have 30 nations. In most cases, they're, they're operating in languages that's not their primary language. And most of the work we do, even though NATO is English and French, it's English. And I've had countless people come up and say, you're so lucky, sir. I go, well, why am I lucky? And they said, because English is your native tongue. And it makes, it makes you really appreciate that these people are planning at a very high strategic level, effective level, in their third, fourth, and sometimes fifth languages. Impressive, incredible, and highly, highly effective. Um, we need to train like we fight. NATO's got to understand that um, when we get these few rare opportunities to execute, uh, like we're executing with Jupiter series, et cetera, that should replicate exactly the way that we're gonna fight um, God forbid we were forced to engage with a threat to the, to, uh, the greatest um, alliance that the world has ever known. God forbid we ever have to do that, but we should take advantage of these opportunities where we're spending millions of euros on these exercises. We should take full advantage of it and train the way we fight. Instead, what we're doing is we've got a bunch of NATO forces and we don't have the heavy U.S. signature that we should have because let's face it, again, God forbid something happens, it will be a heavy U.S. backbone. And we just went through an exercise that didn't have a heavy U.S. backbone. What are we doing? We had a Turkish brigade and a French brigade with French Foreign Legion up in the high north working with the Norwegians. What are we doing? A Turkish brigade? What are we doing? These guys, if the environment doesn't kill them, then they got to worry about the, the Russians. So we've got to get geographically focused. We've got to be serious about this and say, these nations are going to focus on the high north. And, and if we have to fight in there, they've, they've worked with the Norwegians before, they have the equipment, we've got to address some serious issues about logistics and resupply and the capacity to, to reinforce these, uh, uh, these 30 nations that are going to be, you know, uh, called upon harm's way, et cetera. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is uh, this, the SACUR science, what's called uh, the SAGE, so the SACUR's annual guidance um, and uh, and, and, and this sets the stage for these high-level exercises. And what happens is they're set for three years from now. So these are commanders that aren't going to be there when the exercise is being conducted. Six months before we go to exercise these things, again, in this particular iteration, you've got countless nations. <coughs> the majority of the 30 nations are involved with it. These are high-level exercises, and, and it's, it's not the way the commanders want to do business. We can do better. And so what we need to do is we need to get these three and four stars involved, we need to make sure that there's tremendous dialogue with the NAC so that we're executing. At the end of the day, that's another reminder. NATO is not a military organization. NATO is a political organization. Happens to have some military capacity we're willing to invest in, but it's not a military organization. And, uh, and so what do they want us to do? And then we can go and do it. And then next year, we're going to pull the thread from a deterrence only. Next year, we're going to do in Article 5, and it's going to be massive, a behemoth exercise uh, next year on Jupiter 22. So we're, we're hoping we can get it right. And uh, I will end my thoughts with that. I could talk all day about it. What an opportunity it's been for me in the past 14 months. Thank you.